you know, through that. Thank you again. And through that powerful prayer, you just made the declaration for this day because we overcome by the blood of the lamb. You have gave the word of our testimony and I am not going to fear my life unto death. If I mess up, <laughs> I just <laughs> have to make it fun. Right. But it's true. It's true. We're talking about the blood of Jesus Christ. And one of the prayers I prayed today was, you know, as Solomon made the sacrifices and that blood sacrifice, what ended up happening was he he received the favor of God on him, didn't he? But what did he get? He God said, what do you want? And he asked for wisdom, which was for the understanding. It wasn't a personal thing. It was so that he could love the people, take care of the people that were entrusted to him. So that has been my prayer, that I would have that kind of wisdom and understanding that you would get and receive what you need today concerning the blood of Jesus. There, there is so much and so many different ways and aspects we can approach this um we at our school um, have many different streams of christian thought that come in and so um there are so many different approaches to the powerful blood of jesus but i'm going to cover some uh some details in scripture today because i feel like it's very important to have the foundation of it but at first, I do want to tell you a little story, and um, I want to tell you a little story about atonement. Um, back when I, uh, maybe five years ago, I was in Israel, and our tour guide was so great because as we were traveling in Israel, um, he's screaming and pointing to something, and I said, what is that? I'm sitting in the front of the bus. Yes, I bugged him with a gazillion questions because I asked questions, so many questions. Uh, so I said, what are you talking about? And he said, this is the Kippur. And I said, what is Kippur? And he said, this is, this is the, um, the, the tar that sealed Noah's Ark. And I'm, he's a, a Jewish man. And I'm screaming at this point. I'm jumping up and down and screaming, Kippur as in Yom. And he goes, oh. And I pulled up the scripture and I read it to him. So he was talking about the sealing to seal, to make it solid so that when Noah's Ark was sealed, nothing could get in and nothing can get out. And when the door was shut, nothing could get in and nothing can get out. And the, the Lord is the one, God in, in Revelation opens the door that no man can shut and closes the door that no man can open. So if you understand the sealing of that, this is Kippur. This is the atonement. Further, um, I go in, I want to go in to talk about um, Jesus being our Kippur. I'm going to go through some scriptures too, and we're going to talk about how to apply the blood. We're going to, we're going to find out why it's important even today to, to understand the whole picture, but I'm going to kind of process through a few things. Um, so Jesus is our Kippur. In Luke 4, Luke 4, we read that Jesus comes and, and what does he say? He says, I am the Jubilee. He tells us that that's what he is. He's, uh, he's basically talking through that he what he came for. In, in Luke 4, we read that. Um, and so what that ties to is that he is the Jubilee. He came to set the captives free and he came to release the people. We see that in Isaiah, but we also see it in Leviticus 25, where we see what Yom Kippur is, is the day of atonement. I'm going to tie this together at the end too. That's my plan. Anyway, um, so, so we see all of this, that Jesus Christ came and that he is the Jubilee. And some people say, I'm waiting on a Jubilee. No, you have the Jubilee that dwells in you and you are seated in the Jubilee today. That's what you have because he is your atonement. He is your Kippur, Yom Kippur. He is the ceiling of your victory. And this is today, right now. And so we're gonna talk about what all that purchased because it's really important to understand that when he proclaimed it in Luke 4, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And it starts in verse 18. This word, ephesus in Greek, if you look, and how I found this is if you look in the Septuagint, because we have Hebrew and we have Greek, the Old Testament Hebrew, the New Testament Greek, look in the Septuagint and you're going to find ephesus, which is 
the word to release the captives. And that's what he came for. And that's what we see in, in, um, in uh, Luke 4 and Leviticus 25. I've got a whole breakdown of that and I can share it with you, but I've got maybe a, gun, a bunch of pages. I kind of don't know that we have the time for all of that, but I'm kind of, I'm kind of going over some things. And so, um, so understanding, understanding that what he purchased was important, <clears throat> but I do want to talk about why blood. I don't know if you understand why blood, why did blood have to be shed? And, you know, we, we look at a lot of the um, ancient Near East studies for that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to not cover deeply. Uh, there, there's a lot of deep uh, content on here. I'm going to cover some things um, in, a, in a, a, a surface way so that we can make some points and get somewhere in this talk today. So all the way through, why, why was there ritual sacrifice? Why did that happen? Um, the scholars that I have read, uh, you know, are divided on that topic as to why that happened. And you can dig some of that up with um, Keener, Walton. There's some other different names that I can give you of some guys who have dug some of these things up. But a lot of, did, did we copy the rituals of uh, the Canaanites? Did we, did Hebrews copy the rituals of the Mesopotamia? Is that what happened? Or, or was it, that was their nature at the time and God came in and gave them a truth. Is that the truth? Or is it that the further away they got from the garden, the more things got twisted? There are many different topics on how that happened. But understand this, that God does uh, honor this sacrifice. We're going to look at that. I'm going to go ahead. May I share my screen? Is that okay? I'll go ahead and share my screen. Oh, thank you. Okay. We're going to look at a couple um, scriptures in Leviticus 1711 for the life, um, the life, the animal soul is in the blood. I have given it to you. Uh, I've given it for you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls for it is in the blood that makes atonement by reason of life which represent which it represents now this is old testament i understand that but this is why the sacrifices we're, we're seeing what that is that there's life in the blood so it always a sacrifice something some sin always requires blood a blood sacrifice new testament hebrews 9 11 we're gonna we're gonna read through some heavy scriptures here but i'm reading this is the amplified so i might i might stumble a little bit because it, it's got all the extra words but let's keep going but that appoint appointed time came when christ the messiah appeared as high priest um here. Okay, appeared as high as high priest uh, of a better thing that have has come and are to come. Then through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with human hands, that is not a part of this material creation. He went once for all into the holy of holies of heaven. So what happens? Jesus dies and he carries his blood with him. Right? He goes in by virtue, not by virtue of the blood of goats and calves which makes reconciliation between God and man, but by his own blood, having found and secured a complete redemption and everlasting release for us. For it merely sprinkling, for, uh, for, for if it, the mere sprinkling of a, the unholy and defiled person with blood of goats and bulls and ashes of burnt heifers is sufficient for purification of the body, how much more surely the blood of Christ, who by virtue of his eternal spirit, his own pre-existent divinity person or divine person personality has offered himself as unblemished sacrifice to God, purified our conscience from dead works, remember that, and lifeless observances, um, observances to serve the ever living God. Christ the Messiah is therefore the negotiator and the mediator of an entire entirely new agreement, testament, covenant, that those who are called and offered, it may be received the fulfillment of the promise of everlasting inheritance. And so it goes on and it's talking about this is the last will and testament for will and testament is valid and take takes effect at only the death since it has no force or legal power as long as the one who made it is alive. So even the old first covenant, God's will, 
will not be and not or was not inaugurated and ratified and put into force and without what the shedding of blood the shedding of blood okay all right so this this is really important to understand we have the shedding of blood this was a fulfilled promise and Jesus Christ paid that promise and I know you know this but we're going to walk through some scripture so I want you to to look at uh, Genesis 3 1 I'm going to talk through it I'll just I'll share my screen again I'm going to talk through some scriptures here um, and why is that because we, we need to understand this Genesis 3 1 God makes this garment of skin and you've, you've people tell you this you've heard this before but he makes the skin right and so we see this man falls he loses the glory God covers him with skin of animals and he declares I'm going to redeem you the animal dies and for the shed blood now understand this in the old testament that shedding of goats and and bulls that blood it purified but it also comes and if you, i'm copying somebody i can't remember who said this it sweeps it under the rug but for us jesus christ is the vacuum cleaner that sucks it up it's gone forever and that's what's so important revelations 13 8 we see that the inhabitants are, are, of the earth are going to fall down in adoration and pay homage whose name has been whose name has not been recorded in the book of life that was slain in sacrifice from the foundation of the world jesus christ was slain from the foundation of the world and those whose names are not written they will fall down and worship christ he was slain from the foundations of the world god foreordained him and foreknew him and we see that in first peter I'm not going to read through all that but we see that he understood that who christ was he was chosen he was understood now a lot of us believe i'm gonna stop here for a second a lot of us believe too that christ is out outside of time that as he's outside of time what happens the outside of time uh the sacrifice was for all time all right this is this is what i believe that he was outside of time and that sacrifice that blood sacrifice covers my life things are always moving in history it was and it always is i can go outside of time go back go forward because the blood of jesus christ is always there right all right that's I really believe that with all my heart that that it was it was like that. So how did how did Abel know uh, to offer a blood sacrifice? What because his father told him. All right. Now we understand too that um, the idea of Cain's rejection by God. Think about this. There's a lot of talk about that, and there are a lot of different ideas. One idea is that he um, he heard what his father said about the sacrifice but he didn't do he heard he understood but he did something else some would call that pride some would say uh that was rebellion he was not honoring the shema in the old testament of course when all the words are hearing doing or purposeful we understand that and so the shema it means listen or hear to hear means to obey when you hear something you do that something and that's what that is and so when you hear in in the old testament that's about following through what god says everybody with me am i, am I making sense across? okay all right so so the idea was that one of the ideas uh, that that you'll read it that you'll hear people scholars talk about is the rejection of the hearing of of, of not doing that and so this became an issue and so let's look at hebrews um let me, let's look back at hebrews for a second go back to hebrews um hebrews 11 4 um, prompted actually by faith Abel brought God a better sacrifice. It was a better, a better and more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, because of which it would testify of him that he was more righteous. That means he's more upright and right standing with God. And God bore witness by accepting and acknowledging his gifts. And though he died, yet through the incident, he's still speaking. That blood is still speaking from the ground. Okay, what is this telling us? The blood speaks the blood of jesus we hear that the blood of jesus still speaks this is not something that was a once for all and it's not just because i'm taking communion his blood still speaks in the earth it still speaks over my life his sacrifice genesis 7 2 of every clean beast you shall receive and take with you seven pairs the male and his mate and the beast that are not clean and a pair of each kind the male and his mate okay what are we talking about here this is noah we're talking now about noah 
And so I'm kind of going through some scriptures about this. And so what is Noah? Why did he need so many? You know, in Sunday school, what do we, we learn? We learn it's two by two, but no, he had seven seven pairs why was that was that for sacrifice really cool thing to think about very important that we understand that everybody all through the patriarchs we're going to see the sacrifice so i'm going to lay a little a little groundwork um and so we're going to get to some more things here about about the blood in the new testament we understand genesis 8 20 this is what happens when it all stops when noah gets in what does noah do he builds an ark I'm sorry, builds an altar. And what does he do? What happens here? When the Lord smelled the pleasing odor, okay, a scent, a satisfaction to his heart, the Lord said to himself, I'm never, what does he say? I'm not going to curse the ground again, never curse the ground because of man. Okay, for the for the imagination, the strong desire of man's evil heart and wickedness from his youth. Neither will I ever again smite and destroy the living things I have done. While the earth remains, seed time, harvest, cold, heat, summer, winter, and day and night will not cease. This is part of the Noahic covenant. This is this didn't end with the Old Testament. This this doesn't end because because we're because we're not messianic or we're not Christian or we're not. This is God for humanity. Now, given the world today and the mess of things today, this is what just that altar built, excuse me, that building did. When, when Noah built that, God gave a promise, and this is what happened. The blood preserved, the blood's power preserved and kept things for the Noahic covenant, and it changed the weather. Guess what? It's still speaking. Does that mean that there's not going to be judgment? Um, I, you know, we're hearing that there's going to be some judgment, but I'm just telling you right now, this is the covenant God had with Noah. I mean, how powerful is that? Lord, thank you for seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. Lord, thank you that you're not going to smite and destroy every living thing again because of the blood that was shed by Noah for the earth. Lord, thank you for that. Now, I believe we do have responsibility. Don't get me wrong. But I believe this is really powerful and very important to understand. Very important to understand. Okay, so I had started out. I loved, I loved the fact that Kevin declared something here because as we do, I mean, what, what you know, what, how do we overcome? The blood of the lamb. And by the utterance of our testimony, for they did not love and cling to their life, even when they faced death, holding their lives cheap until, until they came to, I, I didn't finish that. But the point, here's the point. The point is the blood is still speaking on my behalf, but I'm going to partner with it. You're going to partner with it by, and I know you know this, by declaring what God is saying over a situation, I'm going to declare, agree with him, not agree with everything else. And I'm going to go full force with all the courage I have, not caring if I live or die, because I have the ability to see it turn because there's power in the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Power in his blood. Well, um, I'm kind of going through Genesis God gives Abraham a promise, Abram, a promise. And what does he do? He builds an altar. And so he builds this altar and he applies the blood to the promise. He applies the blood. Let me, let me say that. He applies the blood to the promise. Old Testament, yes. But this is the idea of how blood works. He applies it to the promise. We're going to see that too in uh, Genesis 26, 24. And here it is again. He says, fear not for I'm with you and will favor you with blessings and multiply your descendants for the sake of my servant, Abraham. Why? Because of the blood. 
this is this is this is amazing amazing to me i mean my spirit's weeping now because of this like it's it's just so i'm just i i just pray right now that that this sinks deep into our hearts lord let it sink deep into our hearts and we would have a real revelation of your blood and isaac builds an altar and he calls it he calls on the name of the lord he called on the name of the lord and pitched a tent there and and the, as they were digging well so this is this is Isaac. So he's getting that favor. He's because he's getting the favor. And so Genesis 33, 18. So he, he arrives when he arrives, then what does he do? Um, Jacob goes ahead and he builds an altar and he applies the blood outside the door. So what happens is that they're having, they keep having the sacrifices. They'll put the sacrifices outside the door, outside the space of where they are. And they, they, they have that sacrifice and they apply the blood of Jesus there. So it's the idea that we're applying the blood of Jesus Christ on certain things. We're going to talk about tying that together and how we apply the blood of Jesus Christ. So Jacob, it was Jacob. We talked about Jacob and he, he applies it outside. And then we have, let me go ahead and, and share my screen again. We have, um, let me keep going. I want to go back to Exodus 12 or go ahead to Exodus 12, 13. The blood shall be what? For a token or a sign. This is when they put the blood of Jesus over the lentil, over the cross piece at the top of the doorpost. This is what Moses had them do, what Christ or the Lord had them do. And why? Because when he sees the blood, I will pass over you and no plague shall be upon you to destroy you when I smite Egypt. Oh, people, let me, let me just, okay. Key, big key, big key. Back when I was saying about Noah changing the weather and keeping things not being destroyed, seed time and harvest, drought, drought, did I say drought? Things that are coming, people are talking about. Look, that people are saying that it's, I mean, I'm, being, I'm giving you some words here too, but people are saying that, uh, you know, it could be global warming or whatever, but I want to tell you, I keep hearing it's God's judgment. Who was the one that smited the land of Egypt? God smited Egypt. What was their answer? When I see the blood, I'm passing over. When I see the blood, what, okay, do I just go on along my merry way and I don't worry about it because Jesus died for me and I'm, you know, I'm in relationship with him and I'm talking. No, he, we have to apply the blood. They apply the blood. They see Jesus. God sees the blood when things start happening for the Lord will pass through to slay the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood, upon the lentil and the two side posts, the door will pass over and will not allow the destroyer to come into your house to slay you. I mean, let, is that not awesome? I know you know this, but is that not awesome? Do we need to fear anything with the power of the blood? Do we need to worry about any of it? No, because we are partnered with God in the power of the blood. Um, also, oh, let's see. Uh, okay. Um, okay. So we, we also see that Paul in first Corinthians says, having not discerned the Lord's body, he's declaring the power of the blood in our lives. I'm not going down that way today. I don't think with communion, but that's another whole, a whole big deal to talk about as you probably know. Well, Moses builds an altar. And what does he do? He comes up, he builds another altar, okay? And they worship at a distance. And so what happens is Moses along, alone shall come. It says, I'm sorry, God said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, Abednego, Aaron's sons, and the 70 Israel, Israel's elders and worship at a distance. So Moses along, alone come near the Lord and the others shall not come near and neither shall the people come up with him. So Moses came and told the people around the Lord, um, all the people that the Lord has said and all the ordinances and all the people answered with one voice, what all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So Moses 
um, then writes the words of the Lord. And he rose up early in the morning and built, and he built an altar at the foot of the mountain. And he set up 12 pillars representing Israel's 12 tribes. And he sent the young Israelite men who offered burnt offering and sacrificed peace offerings. And uh, okay, the young man. Okay, this is a big picture because Moses takes half of the blood. This isn't one. And he puts them in what? Basins and half of the blood and he dashed it against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and he read it in hearing of the people. And they all said to the Lord, this, um, that they said, they all, and that all that the Lord has said, we will do and we will be obedient. All right. And so what happens in this? And Moses took the remaining half. Okay. Think about this. How much blood did, was that? And he sprinkled that on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you in accordance to all the words. Okay. How many people were there that day? How many, how many people were there that day? There were so many people there that day that, that thousands of people that he's sprinkling this blood on that they're taking. So how many, how much blood was there? That was a lot of blood. Side note in my, in my limited um, and continual study uh, and understanding the idea to sprinkle the blood, like with the red heifer and all that they were doing was to cleanse or to purify sacred spaces, to create sacred spaces. And so what they were doing was sprinkling that blood and it was creating a place for God to come and to dwell. I want you to think about that because next in the next little bit, we see that then all of a sudden God saying, Moses, don't come back up here. I want you to build someplace where I can come and dwell with you. Why? Because it was cleansed so that God could dwell with his people. Look at that. I want you to think about that. You are cleansed because of the blood of the lamb, because of Jesus Christ, that you are now a temple. You are the dwelling place of God most high. You are the dwelling. I am a dwelling. You are a dwelling. I'm a habitation. New creation. Kios, Kitos, I believe in Greek, says it, that whole, the root of that word actually means a habitation of a proprietorship of God, like that he, uh, like I'm, I'm his, I belong to him. I'm his dwelling place. I'm his habitation. I become like the temple in Israel. You become like the temple in Israel. You become like Jerusalem, the old Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem dwelling place, habitation, our prophetic words. What are we doing? This is a whole lot I'm throwing at you. Our prophetic words. What are we doing? We are edifying. That is to build up, to tear down the cognate of that word edify doesn't mean to pat you on the back and make you feel good. It means to build you up, to tear down, to do whatever it takes to make you and to make me a dwelling place, a habitation of our God. How, what a wrecking ball. So God, this whole plan, this whole plan from beginning to end, beginning to end has always been the habitation. He just wants to hang out with us. He wants you. He wants me. He wants to dwell with us. And it was the sprinkling of blood. Jesus Christ's blood is what it took. The sprinkling of an entire people group. And that's what happens as we believe and lay hold of Jesus Christ. All right. Um, we're going to move on here. Um, let's see. Hebrews 9. 919. This is, I think this is so amazing. For even for when every command of the Lord has been read out by Moses to all the people, he took the blood, the slain calves, the goats together with water and scarlet wool with a bunch of hyssop and sprinkled both of the book and the roll of the law and the covenant itself and the people. Now in the Old Testament, we don't see all that they did. Um, but if you if you do look that up, that hyssop, very interesting. I think I thought I had a link up here for you, but um, very interesting for the hyssop. Um, in the Jewish understanding, like if you if you look up why hyssop, hyssop was the least plant. It was the shortest plant, but God esteemed it. And a lot of them, a lot of people will say, scholars will say that's because of humility. God 
esteemed it. There, that's one property. There's a lot of properties to his set, but that was one. It was because one of the reason it was because it was small. Isn't that great? And it's part of cleansing the humility with which we are cleansed with, with Christ, with our lives. How beautiful is that? there's listen every word in this bible is like it's just so rich you just want to you just want to open it up and look at it it's just so yummy i'm i'm reminded of solomon 16 one six one six i'm sorry solomon goes up to the bronze altar and i said this uh that he he before the lord and he offered 1000 burnt offerings and that night god appears to him and asks, what shall i give you what shall i give you so the blood is speaking for favor the blood is continually opening doors of favor because as i recognize it Oh, let us stop and honor the blood right now. We're just going to stop. Lord, we just honor your blood. We just thank you for your blood that was shed for us. God, we just honor your blood. Teach us, Holy Spirit, how to greatly honor and revere your blood that was shed on my behalf, that was shed on each person's behalf here, God. Your fire, your blood, God, that makes a difference. And we thank you for it, Lord. Your blood makes a difference. Thank you, Father. We just honor that. We honor your blood. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Ooh. So we said that the sprinkling of blood was for cleansing and creating a sacred space. The blood cleanses. Every time we apply the, the, the blood, the covenant is activated. It's engaged. Um, it, it, it begins to open up some things. It begins to create some things. Look, there's so many avenues. You know, I know we, we honor Holy Spirit. We honor the Father. We honor the Son. We honor uh, the seven spirits of God, the angels, uh, you know, all the things. We, we honor Christ in each one of us. I honor that in you. And I honor all that the Lord wants to show us. I mean, as we get and as we meditate on these things, it becomes so life producing it becomes it becomes part of our reality of how powerful it is um i i, I remember and i i don't know if, if I, I don't know that i have this part recorded but i know one of our our students in our classes um did did her paper and focused on the blood of Jesus. And as she did, um, great miracles happened with um, with some tribal witch doctors in some uh, some crazy places around the world. But she, it, one, I think the one of the impetus, and I don't know, uh, I remember her saying to me, what did you do different? Something shifted in our lives. And I said, what do you mean? She said, something shifted. Have you been doing something different? I said, I've been drawing a bloodline of Jesus Christ of Nazareth around you because I'm done with seeing some of these things happen. She said, I could feel something shift. And so then she began to focus on it and God began to give her this big picture because even, even the tribal people understand the blood. If you go into the territories, I know in Africa and I've heard, I've heard um, all the, like a lot of different stories about this about how they'll recognize blood covenants and how that works. And if you're in Africa, I think you understand it. This is the power of the blood of the, the pure, perfect Jesus Christ that speaks higher than any animal sacrifices, any sacrifices of any human being, anything that happens, anything that's evil that begins to be, somebody sacrifices a human and wants to do something, the blood of Jesus is stronger. There is nothing stronger than the blood of Jesus Christ. It covers us. It protects us. And we're going to see, we're going to see some more on that as well. So, um, so Solomon, okay. In Leviticus 16, 19, and he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times, seven times and cleanse it and consecrate it from unclean cleanliness of the people of Israel. Seven times they sprinkled, seven times they sprinkled the blood. Oh my goodness. Um, so this cleansing, this is, this is really big as they cleansed with seven times. Do you know that Jesus shed his blood seven times? Jesus shed his blood for you and for me seven times. Come on. That is amazing. I think I have it on here. I'm not sure. Yeah, I did. Okay. So he shall take the bull take the bull's blood and sprinkle with his fingers. I put that on here and fingers on the front and the east side of the mercy seat. And before the mercy seat, um, he shall sprinkle the blood with his fingers seven times. Here's the deal. That mercy seat always stayed bloody. 
it always stayed bloody. They didn't wash it. They did not wash the mercy seat off. So Jesus sweat blood on your, on your mind. Your mind has been covered by the blood. And, and then when Caiaphas in Matthew 26 and Isaiah 50, 52, they, they, uh, they buffeted uh, and they, they had blood out of his face. They buffeted him, they beat him and they came out of his face. Isaiah 56, verse six, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheek to those who plucked off my hair. I did not, I hid not my face from shaming, shame and spitting. So he, he had blood on his face. Okay, they beat his face. Um, they whipped. Uh, they put whips. They whipped his head with the crown, reed crowns of thorns. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so they tore at his flesh with the whips, his hands and his feet. He sweat blood. This came out of everything, not just his head. Of course, he sweated. It came out of. It came out of his body. So it, it was. His, he sweated the blood, came out of his face. They whipped his head with reeds and the crowns of thorn. They tore his flesh with whips. He had blood on his hands, his feet, and his side. All of these things, he bled seven times, seven different times. When I read that, to me, that's that's overwhelming. When I Just right now, I just honor the Lord for all that he went through on our behalf. Woo. Now, the tabernacle, the tabernacle, and you've heard it said, I'm sure, that the tabernacle does look a little like a cross, we have the outer court and, you know, we have the, the outer court, which is the altar of sacrifice and the labor. And in that place, there's sunshine and you can see what's happening. And then we have the holy place and there's skins that are covering it. So let's think about it. we're walking in there. The skins are covering it. And what are we seeing? We're seeing the, the table of uh, the lampstand and the showbread. Now, I don't know about you, but um, I've been into some, uh, there were some children who made a, uh, who made um, uh, a model of it and we walked in and it gets a little smoky in there. It gets a little smoky inside the, in there because there's no, there's no chimney. There's no door opening. It's dark. All you're seeing is smoky, hazy, hazy light. So you're, it, it's kind of, it's kind of dark. So it's kind of veiled. And of course we have the altar of incense right before we go in to the Holy of Holies. Now there's no lampstand in the Holy of Holies. Walk through, walk through there with me. There's no lampstand. There's a bloody mercy seat. How do you find it in the dark? Was it dark? Look at it, see it, try to see it, see it in the spirit. Was it dark? What was producing the light? I don't, I don't see it as dark. I, I just see that glory light. I don't know if you do or not. Just see that powerful light coming from the mercy, from the mercy seat, the glory light. Woo! Is that not powerful? Jesus makes a way through that, through his glory comes through. I mean, that, that to me is so powerful. Jesus makes a way through his blood, through the blood. And, and then all through history, we're seeing that God reveals it to the patriarchs. And to Israel at Mount Sinai, to Solomon, to others, he reveals the power of the blood. What does the blood do? He's revealing the power to us of what they did and how to live that. But Jesus does make the way for us. <clears throat> After Moses applies the blood to the people, you know, God makes that sanctuary so that he dwells with them. And we talked about that. Now I want to I want to go back. Um, Leviticus, let me see here. Leviticus eleven. We talked about the life of the blood, the flesh. Um, so do I have that on here? I don't. Yeah. No. No. Okay. All right. Um, so Leviticus eleven says the life of the flesh is in the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. 
Blood is a ransom. It was used for a ransom. It's the payment that, that Jesus made to release us, as we said at the beginning. It's the payment he paid, the ransom for the atonement. He is my atonement. It is my ransom to release me. Guess what? You're not waiting to be released. You're not waiting to be set free. This is done because of what he did, Luke 4, Leviticus 25, and Isaiah. This is all because it's done. You're not waiting for a jubilee to happen. This is done. This is done. So it's here, it's now. It's here and it's now. There's a purchase, he purchased and released the captives. It's the currency. People talk about faith as currency. The blood is currency. The blood of Jesus purchased that for us. It has that purchasing power. It also reminds Satan that the, the saints are not being judged, that they have, well, there's a judgment that comes, but there's freedom also that the saints have the freedom. The blood is an earthly origin. It's because it's heavenly. It even has a higher realm. So it doesn't matter the curses over you. It doesn't matter what people are saying. The blood goes back and changes that. It's sufficient. The blood of Jesus is sufficient for everything. Instead of speaking judgment of sin, we, it speaks of mercy for you and for me. <clears throat> so Satan can come and accuse us, but the blood of Jesus stops it. So we, we, um, we don't have to agree with that. We don't have to agree with him. So we agree what's been happening. So, so Satan comes and let's just say he accuses you're standing before the Lord and there's an accusation. We're going to talk about Job here in a minute. There's an accusation against you. There's something against you. Maybe your relative sacrificed something that you didn't know. And there's that accusation against you when you just Lord, you know, forgive me if there was something that, that I need to repent for. What happens is the minute I call upon the blood of Jesus, the Lord says, okay, you're done. Walk away. And then Jesus stands there with Satan. And he says, he says, um, I have the blood. There has been a sacrifice made on behalf of that person. Death happened. That person died. That person died with me. I, I am now standing in that place. You are free. That no longer can, can carry out. It no longer can speak, even over the generations. Remember, I talked, we're outside of time. I believe that we, we can be outside of time and be and see the whole thing. The point is, if it happened back there and we, we are outside of time, we're speaking the blood, which, okay, does that heal everything all the way up to you? That's a mystery worth meditating on. That's a mystery that is powerful to think that that blood, as I'm speaking and declaring it all through my bloodline, I am stopping it from that point forward, whatever that is, the blood of Jesus is that powerful. It's speaking outside of time. It's speaking inside of time because God knows what we need. Lord, thank you for your blood speaking continually, speaking, speaking on our behalf. So we stand and we agree, but we, we invoke the blood. And now it's not about me again. It's really about Jesus at that moment. There is no accusation. All of a sudden I'm stepping back and he's standing in front of me and he says, enough, that's done because of the blood of Jesus. Yes, 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 yes. Speaking inside of time. Yes. Amen. Amen. But he is outside speaking inside and it goes back and forward. I really believe that with all my heart. It is the power of the blood of Jesus. Lord, let us lay hold of the mysteries of the blood of Jesus and walk in the fullness of this. Our faith, our faith is not about me doing doing good or being good. It's about me being transformed into his image by the revelation that I gain in my heart right? And so I'm being transformed. I'm being transformed. So, so when, let's look at Job. What did Job do? I know we're talking Old Testament, but I want to, I want to jump in here one more time. Let's, let's see what we got here. Let's look at Job. I think I've got Job in here. Yeah. Okay. When the days of their feasting were over, Job sent for them to purify and hallow them. He's talking about his children. And he rose up early in the morning and he offered a burnt offering 
according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed or disowned God in their hearts. Thus, Job, Job, thus did Job at all such times. And then Job 1.10, here is the complaint that Satan has about Job. He says, have you not put a hedge about him and his house? Let's look at this. Have you not put a hedge about him, his house, all that he has on every side? Oops, let me just, you, you have conferred prosperity and happiness upon him and the work of his hands and his possessions have what? Increased. So these are some things that we can understand that the blood of Jesus can do. The blood of Jesus speaks. So would it be a stretch to say that Satan recognizes the application of the blood of Jesus Christ as a hedge around you? Can we honor the blood and apply it daily? Lord, we apply the blood of Jesus around ourselves, around our house, our children and family. Lord, we apply the blood of Jesus Christ around our family, our children, our grandchildren, whoever, whatever, whoever your, your covering is. About your possessions, Lord, I apply the blood of Jesus Christ about around every possession you've given me, the powerful blood of Jesus Christ. The work of our hands, Lord, I applied the powerful blood of Jesus around my job, my ministry, around everything that I put my hands to. Why? That everything should prosper. Deuteronomy, that everything should prosper in the land he's giving me. Lord, I, I apply the blood of Jesus and the substance increase in the land for my influence here. This right here, possession have increased in the land. What? So over my influence and relationships, favor, in other words, Lord, I thank you for the blood of Jesus speaking favor on my behalf. The power of the blood brings the spirit. I believe in the angels. This is what I believe. It, it, it releases some mighty things. There's miracle anointing power in the blood of Jesus Christ, and the enemy can't get through the bloodline. You have to say it daily. It is your biblical proof. But sometimes I think we, we get so busy doing other things that it's hard to, it's hard to, um, uh, you know, you know, do I, do I do that daily? Holy Spirit, I just ask Holy Spirit to bring it to our remembrance, to understand this is our hedge of protection. It is why always go back. I overcome by the blood of the lamb, the word of my testimony, not loving my life unto death. And I, as we look at that, we know you're not waiting for something to happen because Jesus Christ is that atonement. And he came to set you free. We see that in Luke four. Also, Luke four goes on. If you study that Luke four goes through the entire chapter and it begins to break down after Jesus said what he came to do. He goes out and he models it. He sets people free physically. He heals them. He does all this. Why? Because he came. He says, this is what I came for. I'm going to show you how this is the good news. This is the good news. You carry that you carry Right now, you carry, because of the blood of Jesus, because you believe, you carry the good news. That good news is to release the captives because Jesus Christ paid it and made the jubilee. You're out, you guys are out there making little jubilees of everybody. You're little jubilee makers, right? We, we are. We're, we are. We show up. We understand atonement because Christ did it. We understand I walk in the blood. I don't have to fear any weird things that happen because the blood stops it at the door. It stops it. It won't let it happen. And I thank God for that power, that power that is immeasurable and mighty beyond all things that we can ever ask or expect. And so all of that, all of that in understanding is the big picture of what we understand the blood to be.
Now I know, and I know that there's so much more as we take as we take communion, as we take all of these things, as we understand the big picture of how that works, there, there's so many levels to the blood of Jesus. And everything that we talked about today were just little, little snippets of a bigger revelation that God begins to show us as we begin to cry out. I remember, um, I remember years ago that, um, I think it was a Benny Hinn, somebody was talking about um, that every day that, that this, this um, was it a witch was sitting in his seminar. I think it was Benny, the, a witch was sitting in his seminar. And I'll never forget this. This just really made such a difference to me. And, and finally, he, this guy gave his life to, to Christ. And he came to Benny, I, I believe, this, I, I don't, I've got to find it, Kevin, and I'll, I'll have to find it where he said it, but um, I believe that he said um, that this man fasted and prayed to kill Benny, but he couldn't do it because, because of the blood, because of the blood of Jesus, and he gave his life to Christ. This is the power, the power of the blood, immeasurably bigger than we can ever think or ask. So, um, yeah, so I, th I think I thank God for that. Kevin, <laughs> thank you, Lord. <laughs>